Okay. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. I'm going to sh shake your head if you can hear me. Great. Okay. Here we go. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this, this next series, this new series, uh, our uh, Elul tune up in preparation for the Yamim Noroim, for uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a very special, intense, spiritual time, a uh, time of great, great opportunity. Uh, and we want to explore our spiritual resources during this period. Um, we're heading towards uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah, New Year. Uh, how do we access newness? You know, how do we, what does it mean, a new year? Uh, it's not just a, a, you know, flipping a page in a calendar. How do we access that, that sense of newness? What are our spiritual resources for that? And that's what we'd like to explore together. Uh, so I, let me um, put up the screen share, just one second for everyone. Uh, can everyone see that? Um, yeah, it's on there, good. Hopefully it comes across. So the, uh, I put together uh, some sources for those of you that are um, uh, joining us for the first time. Uh, we'll go through a set of sources from the Talmudic, philosophic, Kabbalistic, Hasidic traditions uh, that will open up a theme in consciousness. Uh, and then our goal here is to meditate uh, and to experience the insights that we've been uh, that we've been exploring, uh, not just as ideas, but to experience them directly uh, as openings in consciousness. Uh, that's the general approach. And here, the the um, kind of the, the theme here that will that uh, that we're uh, exploring for this first the first of this series. Now we're, we're working towards a new year. Uh, there's a, a major theme in Kabbalah uh, uh, around the, uh, the, the phenomenon of mochin chadashin, uh, new consciousness. Mochin is a, a term that's, that's used in, in the Zohar and in Kabbalistic terminology. Uh, moach is brain, but mochin is used in the sense of consciousness. How do we access new consciousness? I thought as a general introduction to the um, to Elul itself, the month of Elul, preparation for transformation in Rosh Hashanah. Uh, to start with a beautiful passage from Sfat Emet of Rabbi Huda Arielei uh, Alter Gur, the, the Gera Rebbe in Sfat Emet, uh, that gives us a bit of an orientation of what, what is Elul about. So he says, you know, every place that they say that a certain period of time is a uh, eight ratzon is the phrase in Hebrew, a time of favor, usually interpreted as a time of divine favor, uh, where spiritual growth becomes, you know, especially possible, though the theology of that is tricky, and he's going he's to wrestle with this issue. What do you mean a time of favor, uh, a time of divine favor? It isn't every time a time of divine favor. Uh, as, as he says, whenever they speak of this, and Elul is such a time, this month that we're in, the month before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the third meal of Shabbat is considered a uh, ratzon. Uh, the 10 days, the Aseret Yimei Tshuva, the days between, including Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, are also considered an eight ratzon. So every place where they talk about a time of divine favor, even though for Hashem, he says, blessed be he, time is not relevant. What do you mean divine favor? It's a special time that it's time is, is not relevant to God. God is beyond time, space, beyond God is Ein Sof, the infinite. Therefore, the explanation is that it is a time of favor for a person, for a human being, that he or she is able to bring themselves close and adhere to the Holy One, blessed be he, with a true will in the innerness of the heart. Because he says, the Holy One, blessed be he, God is full of favor, Malay Ratzon. God wants, God's de desire for us, so to speak, to, uh, uh, for, for blessing and for chesed, for love and for, you know, for all good things, 
is infinite. Uh, it, there's no one time better than another. It's infinite. It's, it's eternal. But he says, but only someone who merits it can draw close to him. What do you mean merits it? In what way do we, we merit drawing close to God? He says, this, water is face to face. What he means by that is that our, this, he's actually uh, referencing the Rambam, Maimonides here, in the Mor Nebuchim. The, uh, Maimonides says that to the degree to which we are more aware of God, God God's personal hashkacha, God's personal providential care for us is more direct and more intense. It's a reciprocal relationship. The more aware we are of God's presence, the more God's presence and the more God, uh, God's hashkacha extends to us. And you can debate that, but that's the, that's the Rambam, Maimonides in, in Guide of the Perplexed, and that's what he's referencing here. But then he shifts it, he shifts it, and he says, and this is the key passage, according to the arousal of compassion in the heart for compassion in the heart for himself, for yourself. In other words, according to how you have compassion for yourself in this time, how there is within him a point of holiness from the, from the Holy One, blessed be he, but he is sunk into matter and corporeality. Put, put yourself into this. According to arousal of compassion in your heart for yourself in this time, how we recognize in ourselves that we have a, a point of holiness, but more than a point, as we'll see. We have a consciousness of holiness from the Holy One, blessed be He. And yet we are also sunk into matter and corporeal reality, which tracks us, tracks us in certain patterns, which kind of um, gets us stuck in certain ways. According to the arousal in your heart like this, in other words, that you have some compassion for yourself, deep compassion for yourself, there is aroused upon him great compassion in heaven as well. Get the point here. This is a, an eight ratzon, the month of Elul, uh, a time of favor. It's not a time of divine favor, first and foremost. It's a time of favor, meaning compassion, meaning giving blessing, giving permission to yourself, you know, having, you know, so cutting yourself some slack in a certain sense, forgiving yourself. You know, this is going to be a time of, of um, you know, we work on self-awareness, we, uh, we, we do cheshbon uh, and nefesh, um, self-accounting, judgment, also compassion for ourselves. Uh, and the compassion is, uh, it's a, a dynamic compassion, a recognition that we have within us essential holiness from God directly at the very core of consciousness itself. And yet also, the challenge of being in, in the body, embodied in the material world as well, uh, and the challenges between them. Uh, and if we have, if, if in this dynamic sense of compassion, we arouse ourselves in our heart, uh, there is aroused for us great compassion in heaven as well. Okay, so this is a time in which there's great opportunity uh, the opportunity is what something that we open for ourselves with a, sen with a sense of compassion. It's a very important theme, uh, and uh, I, I recommend it to come back and back to this throughout the, throughout the month. So, Rosh Hashanah, a new year. What's new? <laughs> what is newness? You know, so the uh, the core source for us on uh, Rosh Hashanah is the Mishnah and the Gemara in the tractate Rosh Hashanah, in the second Rosh Hashanah. The Mishnah says, at four times of the year, the world is judged. On Pesach for grain, on Shavuot for the fruit of the trees, on Rosh Hashanah, all the people of the world pass before him, God, like sheep, as it says, Vayotzer yachad libam hamevin el kol ma'asehem. God creates their hearts as one. Uh, this, by the way, is a reference to collective consciousness of all of mankind, all of human being, uh, that our consciousness, we share consciousness together. You know, that's how we're having this conversation across the planet Earth, even on Zoom. We're sharing consciousness together. Uh, and, and not just through the words that we use between us, but 
we share consciousness, which allows those words to, you know, to uh, pass between us meaningfully. So God, God, God creates our hearts as one. We are all, and we're in this moment together, sharing consciousness. He understands all the consequences of their actions. I mean, being el kol to where he understands to where all of their actions go. So it's a time of judgment, but it's a time of divine understanding as well. We'll see what that means. And on Sukkot, all are judged for water. The Gemara now on this Mishnah, and you can see it, you either saw it before, you'll see it after, uh, then um, talks about what, what does it mean there are four times of the year, uh, what, uh, what are those four times, Rosh Hashanah, uh, the, the Yomim Tovim, uh, the, the Holy Days. Uh, so those are times spread out throughout the year for, for different you know, days or periods throughout the year. But then at the end of this section, it says, Rabbi Yossi says, in truth, man is judged every day. Human beings are judged every day. As it says in Eov and Job, and you consider him every morning. Every morning, God you know, discerningly examines us, judged us. Natan says, man is judged at every moment. As it says, at every minute, every moment, you examine him. Okay, so we have this passage in the Gemara that begins with the traditional idea that there are four special days of judgment throughout the year, Arba Rosh Hashanim Heim, Arba Prakim HaOlam Nidan, four special days. But then the Gemara says, but wait a second, in truth, it's not, it's not that God has four special times. God, is, again, is eternal, infinite, beyond time space. So it's what Yossi is saying, human being is actually judged every day, or maybe not time, every moment. And that certainly theologically makes more sense. But we have the question now, what does that have to do with what we call Rosh Hashanah? Um, which is the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we call it a new year. What's, how, what's the connection between judgment and newness? And why do we as Jews uh, celebrate, so to speak, Rosh Hashanah, not with fireworks and champagne, but with divine judgment? Okay, uh, we're, we're a dour bunch. Uh, why, what is this? What does judgment have to do with newness? Well, in last week's parasha, in Shoftim, you know, there's the, the verse, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdov, Leman Tichyev Yerashta Et Aretz. Righteousness, righteousness, you should pursue actively in order that you live and inherit the land. So here, the, in Sefer Abahir, which is um, maybe our earliest Kabbalistic Midrash uh, first, um, you know, s seems to have uh, have come out at, at uh, in the early 13th century, maybe late 12th. Um, it's our first, you know, uh, pure Kabbalistic Midrash. It says, "Sedek, Sedek Tirdov, Uktiv Batrei Leman Tichyev Yerasha Et Aret." So, righteousness, righteousness, you should pursue in order that you shall live and inherit the earth. If you judge yourself, you will live. If you judge yourself, you will live, but if not, he will judge you and will stand against your will. What is this idea of judging ourselves? We saw again, having compassion on ourselves uh, is what the month of Elul is about, to allow ourselves to grow in our Kedusha, in our holiness, and here to judge ourselves. And what does judgment have to do with Tichyeh, that you'll live? What, what, what's the connection? So, you know, we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, a time of newness. Where, how do we access newness? You know, what, uh, what kind of effort do we make? Is, is, is there a spiritual effort to make to, to, make, to access newness? You know, what, what's that about? Why, and why is life and somehow this newness connected with judgment? So in Rav Chaim Vital's Priyetz Chaim, Rav Chaim Vital was the great student of the Arizal, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, 16th century Tzvat. 
the great, the greatest Kabbalist, Rav Yitzchak Luria. Uh, and the pre Chaim is his halachic work uh, on uh, the halachic implications of the Arizal system. Uh, and he has an extraordinary passage here. He's this in the gate of prayer in this section. Uh, he's talking about the consciousness of contemplative tefillah, of contemplative prayer. Uh, and you know, the, the whole Torah of the Arizal is a Torah of consciousness. Okay? It's a, a profound exploration of the nature of human consciousness as an emanation of divine consciousness. Uh, so here he says, that which he wrote above, that each and every prayer service at each and every prayer service, we pray three times a day. Uh, the consciousness departs from the small face and the feminine, the zeran pin, the hanukva. This is from two sphera levels, tiferet and malchut. I don't want to get into the technicalities, but in other words, while we're in prayer, there's a certain unification of consciousness, our consciousness and divine consciousness. And when we finish the tefillah, the prayer, that consciousness departs. So he says, don't make a mistake on this and think that the same consciousness itself that departed is the very one that returns after that as the aspect of another prayer service. And so to each and every prayer service. So in other words, we pray three times a day. We use the same liturgy. It's called a, uh, a fixed liturgy, Nusach Keva. Uh, it's, you know, there's different things for the morning and the afternoon and the evening service the different liturgy, but basic core is the same. The, um, though there are differences on Shabbat and on Yom Tov, etc. Uh, he says, don't think that uh, every time you pray and then you finish prayer and then you, you, know, you come to the next prayer service, let's say from the morning to the afternoon, that it's the same consciousness that returns to the next prayer service. Rather, the matter is not thus, says, for each and every prayer service, completely new consciousness is innovated. And you don't have any prayer service for which there is no innovation of completely new lights. This is not like that. Uh, the double negative here. In other words, for every prayer service, there is completely new lights. Lights, as we say many times, lights is a metaphor for consciousness. Okay. Uh, in this case, divine consciousness. Every new pr prayer service has different consciousness. This not like that. Everyone is different. Uh, and he, he goes on, interesting, and it gets kind of poetic. You need to know that there's a great difference between the prayer of the weekday and the prayer of Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, the prayer, the prayer of Yom Tov and the prayer of the intermediate days of the festival, the prayer of Shabbat. All of them are different, different consciousness. Divine consciousness is different, and our consciousness is different. Greater than that, even on Yom Tov itself, the prayer of Pesach does not resemble the prayer of Shavuot or the prayer of Sukkot. Greater than that, even on the weekday prayer itself, the prayer of today does not resemble the prayer of yesterday. Greater than all these, even for the prayer of each and every day, there's a big difference between them. And the morning prayer does not resemble the prayer of Mincha, the afternoon, or the prayer of evening. The conclusion of the matter, and this is the kicker, you do not have any prayer from the day the world was created until the future to come, at the end of history, you don't, you don't have any prayer that resembles its counterpart at all. Every moment of contemplative prayer is different. From the, very, from the day the world was created to the, to the end of the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful you know, uh, way of saying this. And what he's saying is that, you know, every every one of these prayer services and the consciousness that infuses them is infinitely precious, an infinitely precious, non-repeatable, not to be repeated opportunity. You know, extraordinary. Um, the, the Baal Shem Tov also took this really uh, experientially uh, to feel that we are in a constant flow of newness in consciousness, certainly in the, in the experience of tefillah in prayer, he's going to take this even further, Rav Chaim Bital, in just a moment. But to, to know that, you know, you, you, you don't go back, you can't repeat, you can't repeat, you can't even repeat a prayer. There's a, 
um, there's a notion in, in halacha that if you, you know, uh, prayed something without a full, full kavanah, with full intent that, uh, and it's cer certain that the prayers are so important that we repeat them, the Baal Shem Tov says, you can't repeat them. The consciousness is different. Uh, you, and, and, and we just need to keep moving in the flow of divine consciousness that we are being gifted at every moment. So Chai Vital takes us even further now, and this is what we need for, for our purposes uh, in Elul. So he says, and here at the beginning, he's, he's talking about all the technicalities of different um, permutations, combinations, concatenations of the spherot. Uh, and then he says, and this, I want to just do this directly here, he's about four lines down. Not only that, you know, they're, they're all, they're, all of the, the permutations and combinations of relationships of the divine qualities are changing at every instant. Not only that, but in each and every moment, the worlds change. And this moment does not resemble that moment. So it's not just a question of prayer services. Each, at each and every moment, the worlds change. This moment I'm saying now does not, it's not the same as this moment I'm saying now, right? They're all different. And someone, he gives an example, someone who gauges at the motions of the planets and stars and the change in their situation and status, and how in one moment they appear in another moment differently, such that one who was born under a particular planet, you know, he's talking astrologically, a planet um, configuration, will have events happen to him that are different from one born a moment earlier. Okay, I mean, if, if you don't buy into astrology, uh, frankly, if you're just, uh, you know, to a scientific, you know, astrophysics approach, yeah, every moment things are changing in dynamic change, nothing is repeated. And from this one should envision and understand regarding the supernal worlds, the heavenly worlds, that they have no limit or number. And if you open the eyes of your intellect, you'll know and apprehend this intellectually and inductively and deductively, for there is no, no sufficient intellect in the heart of a human being to comprehend all the details. And regarding this, King David, peace be upon him, said in Tehillim and Psalms, unveil my eyes, gal enai ba'abita nitla'ot mitoratecha, unveil my eyes so I'll behold the wonders of your Torah. Chaim Vital here is saying, every moment is new consciousness. And that is true. Okay. There's, you know, we have, a, we have a, uh, a perception of continuity. Uh, we have uh, a sense that we have, that we maintain an identity, that the world around us maintains a stability. Um, if we, you know, um, have some awareness of uh, quantum, mechanics, we do know that what seems like solid material around us is really packaged energy, right? Uh, all all the, the atomic particles are packaged energy held together by the four forces, as the physicists understand this, gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak nuclear force. And this world is shimmering energy held in place but shimmering. It is dynamic energy that is changing at every moment while being held in place. And our perception of this is also changing at every moment. You know, our nervous systems work through, uh, you know, our, our neurological systems work through our excitation and relaxation, excitation, relaxation across synapses, right, of the neural synapses. Uh, and so basically, you know, you're looking at a, a computer screen in front of you. This screen in front of you that looks fairly stable and you're seeing stable images is actually flickering at a, at a, at a rate that's fast than our, than our eyes perceive. So we see stability, but it's being refreshed, refreshed, you know, at every instant. Well, actually, that's how our nervous systems work. Uh, we get the impression of continuity and stability, but it's by being refreshed at every instant. Those synapses are firing you know, uh, very quickly, more, much more overlapped, much more sophisticated than a, you know, than a, uh, a, you know, a computer monitor. And we get the impression of continuity, even though everything that we're seeing around us is energy that's shimmering, packages, packaged and changing at every instant. And our ability to see it is changing every instant. And our consciousness is picking this up at every instant. Constant change, constant newness. Where does the renewal come from on Rosh Hashanah? 
It's all around us and in us, and it is us. We are new, new, new at every instant. We hold ourselves back. We allow ourselves to get trapped. Uh, we may get stuck on, let's say we did something or someone did something to us over the past year. And we obsess about it, we think about it, uh, we're stuck with this, we, uh, you know, and then the serious cases of trauma, which really lock us in. Uh, what's the basis of being able to forgive someone or to forgive oneself or to, to release from the, you know, everything that locks us into a, um, a fixed stability? I mean, yes, to understand the mistake and to have um, harata, to have regret for what was done and to really uh, do tshuva and to really ask sincere forgiveness. All these are important. But what's really underneath it all is that Hashem is renewing this reality at every instant. Every instant. You know, our, we're going to talk about this in, a, in, a, in a, um, one of the, the classes to come, you know, one of the sessions to come. But um, the that we get sort of fixed on a past issue. I mean, there's, there's what to process because those issues pat, pattern our, our behavior now in the present. But to really release from those past issues and not let them you know, lock us into a, a, an obsessive or a compulsive way of thinking is to realize we're changing at every instant. The world is no longer the world that happened back there you know, in the past. It's new, new, new at every moment. And the, the resource for forgiveness is right here. We're, we're in this at all, every moment. Forgiveness for others, forgiveness for ourselves, to ourselves even. The compassion that the, the Gera Rebbe says we should have for ourselves is because we're new, new, new at every moment. So the judgment, the process of judgment that we do uh, Rosh Hashanah and the divine judgment, it's not a punishing process. It's a process of analysis, of cheshvon nefesh, of, of the self-accounting, to realize the mistake, to regret it, to get it out of us, to get it out of our system, to not be stuck in it, to not have to get our nervous system patterned in it and our thinking patterned in, in negative behaviors. And we allow ourselves, allow ourselves to feel the renewal and the newness that is with us at every moment in a sincere way. We're not letting ourselves off the hook irresponsibly, it's responsibly. The judgment is a process, a self-judgment process, as well as the world judging, you know, the, the heavens judging us, God judging us, but it's a self-judgment process to free ourselves from negative patterns. And that opens us up to the constant renewal that is life. New consciousness every moment, meaning our consciousness picks, is able to pick up life, to, in other words, to sense the newness of life at every moment. And this is what we end with, with Svat Emet. It says, the life that we seek on Rosh Hashanah, Zachrein Lechayim, we ask God, please remember us for life is because on Rosh Hashanah, human being, mankind was created. And mankind is the essence of life. How is that? All the life of the world is by means of mankind. Wait a second, living beings have their life. Not, we, they're not dependent on us, but they are in a certain way. As it's written, you made the heavens and the heavens of the heavens, and you enliven them all. The explanation, the entire creation of the work of the beginning, you know, Genesis, is a contraction of divinity enclosed in nature. The concept of tzimtzum from the Arizal, of contraction, divine contraction enclosed in nature. It's written in the Kabbalistic books regarding creation, Yeshme Ayin, of the something from nothing, that prior to creation, there wasn't nothingness, there was fullness of divine glory. Malo kol aretz kavodo, the whole of reality is God's glory before creation. And there was no existence of any individual separate thing except by contraction of divine light, blessed be he, and then existence was made. And the more the creatures extended out you know, and proliferated, this was an aspect of death. For every descent and lowering is called death. And he, there he's quoting a passage from Eitz Chaim in uh, Rav Chaim Vital, in the 
the, the Torah of the Arizal, that all, uh, it's def- not in a literal sense, but a diminishing. After that, human being was created and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, Nishmat Chayim, and the human being became a living soul. Adam Lenefesh Chaya, or a soul of livingness, you know, a living soul, meaning that human being is a vessel that returns and draws life from the life of life, God, the life of life, to all the work of creation. That's our job as human beings. And this is what, our, what human consciousness is about, to reflect life to all living beings. This is a, an essential aspect of the Torah of the Arizal and uh, uh, the, the Geva Rebbe is bringing us here. We are those that re- re- we return and draw life, the life of life to all the work of creation, all created beings. Therefore, the human being called names for all. Adam calls names to all of the creatures. For he's the one who elevates and binds every creature to the life of life, the awareness of life. Therefore, tzaddik is called living. And this is the light that descends on Rosh Hashanah, for there is renewal from the root of life. So putting all this together, and then we'll do a meditation on this, to experience it, not just to think it, but putting the, the basic principles together, the, the awareness that we have is th- that we want to cultivate is that consciousness is new at every moment. Uh, it's a being refreshed, so to speak. We're being held in place, but we're not doing the holding, as we say. We're, we have an, uh, what seems to be an ab- abiding identity but actually it's being refreshed, it's shimmering at every moment, new, even though it's being held in place and we're not doing the holding. It's effortless. We are here, it's effortless. We find ourselves a gift to ourselves and all of reality and it's effortless. We're being held in place, we're not doing it. But that holding is a constant refreshment of newness, new consciousness, life bubbling, at every instant. So the newness is all around us and in us and through us. Now we start to hold on to narratives and stories about ourselves and stories about the world and identities of all kinds. Some of them are positive, some of them are um, less so or more self-defeating. This is a time to dissolve the negative identities and the negative narratives to acknowledge judge them in a, in a sense of dis, be discerning about them, figure out what are the things that are, have been helpful for us, what are, what are those that are poisonous to our spiritual growth, get out of that, let those things dissolve. And the newness comes automatically. It's not something we have to make new. We are new already at every moment. We need to realize it. We need to get quiet enough open enough, tap into what the Gera Rebbe calls, the Sfat Emet calls our Kedusha, Nikuda, Kedosha, our holy point that is our essential consciousness from Hashem, from God, which is new, new, new at every instant. Uh, and as we allow the, the things that, in, that kind of chain us to, you know, we give ourselves permission and compassion to let those things go. Uh, and for each other, forgiveness and compassion to let those things go in responsible ways, uh, in sincere ways, we can access the newness that is there all around us. And this is going to be the, the basis of our meditation. Uh, we have a verse from you know, Tehillim, the Tehillim that we say uh, uh, twice a day now during this period of Elul, it begins with David, Adonai ori v'yishi mimi ira. Adonai ma'oz chayai mimi afchad. David, Hashem is my light and my salvation. Who should I fear? Hashem, God, is the empowerment of my life. Ma'oz chayai. Of whom should I be afraid? And this is what basically we've been saying. God is the empowerment of our lives. Knew it every instant. 
beyond what we can imagine. So let me just lay out the meditation. We're going to take a break and then we're going to do it. Uh, this is, you know, we've been doing this approach, um, hashkata, which is quieting. Uh, those of you who uh, are, uh, are new to this group uh, and you have some familiarity or perhaps deep familiarity with mindfulness meditation, it's quite similar in this way. Uh, hashkata comes out of uh, a tradition that really uh, it goes back to Maimonides, the Rambam, but uh, the form in which we're practicing it is from the Piazetz Nerebi, the Miklonovs Kalmus Shapiro Piazetz. Um, it's, quiet, it's called quieting in the sense that we are quieting our narrative thinking, you know, that, that narrative voice in our head, the, the verbal thinking that goes on in the mind. Uh, but that's, we're also quieting every aspect of our awareness. Uh, the, you know, the, let me just describe it briefly. Those of you who, um, uh, who know this well, we've gone over this many times, uh, give us just a little patience for a moment. We're sitting uh, in the chair or on the floor, uh, eyes closed for this meditation. Uh, the, our, our goal is to achieve, or our aim, not a goal, our aim is to achieve global awareness or comprehensive consciousness of everything that is happening in us and around us all at once, which is the natural state of consciousness, not directed by attention in narrow ways, but totally open, totally quiet. Uh, the Taking everything in as being as passive and quiet as possible. Okay, so, you know, begin with, and here we, we don't, this is not a, a meditation of focusing on a particular phenomena, it's letting everything, sort of accepting and receiving everything, our breathing, you know, in the process of inhaling and the, ex the experience of inhaling and if, how you feel it at the nostrils and how you feel your lungs expand and it stops, and then exhaling and how, you, how it feels at the nostrils, how it feels in the, in the, the lungs and the chest and the, the, at the nostrils as we exhale, but also as we're breathing, our heart is beating, and to sense our heart beating, and maybe feeling it you know, in our chest or in other pulse points around the body. And we're sitting on a chair or on the floor and to feel the, 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 the sensation of you know, body held by gravity against the ground. There may be sounds around us, ambient sounds, uh, not to focus, you know, you hear something here, you hear something, you know, just quiet, taking everything in without shifting focus, without shifting attention, just atten totally quiet, passive, receptive attention to all sounds, uh, to any other stimuli that are, that are impacting us. Our eyes are closed, there may be a uh, little flashing of lights in the retina, uh, our, uh, there may be a taste on our tongue from Know, from a meal or uh, there may be a, a fragrance in the air, taking everything in. And when we're really comprehensively aware in all, way, all at once, it helps us to quiet, be quiet. Hashkata, it's called, quieting. If thoughts arrive, uh, arise, which they will, uh, generally speaking, in hashkata, we, we acknowledge that thoughts are arising and we back off the thoughts, as the Pizetz and Rebbe says. We just, we, we don't try to push them out. We don't try to crush them. We let them happen, but we don't follow the themes of the thoughts. We just, just a general, you know, sort of a, a factual awareness that thought, that a, thing, a thought is happening and we disengage gently. Uh, the Piazzat Rebbe says very clearly that any, any uh, intense motion of the mind in meditation tends to set up um, echoes and reactions. We, we want to quiet things down. So we're not pushing anything away. That would just cause a, an opposite reaction. We just, if thoughts come, let them go. Don't follow the themes. Back off of the themes. If you find yourself getting caught in a train of thought, uh, once you're aware of it, just disengage again gently, everything gently. Okay. Now, that's the general hashkata, and we'll uh, do that for five minutes. Then you'll hear a little, this little bell. Uh, signal now to shift into the uh, the cognitive level of this meditation. Now, in meditation, uh, our goal here in a goal, our aim, 
in Jewish meditation in, uh, is not to attain a kind of a trance state, but to be awake. Uh, the, it's not just relaxation, but it's in a state of quieting of conscious uh, of the mind uh, in a nonverbal, totally open state, than to experience the essential existential truths of our existence. In this case, we've been talking about the issue of constant renewness, continual renewness, re renewing or newness of consciousness, which is really consciousness is mystery that it is. We don't know what consciousness is, but in consciousness, we are able to be aware of all phenomena of life itself. Uh, and one of the beautiful aspects of consciousness is it can pick up constant newness. So here we are, we're sitting and we're aware that breathing is happening, heartbeat is happening, sounds, you know, ambient sounds may be happening, uh, various physical stimuli that we're picking up, sense stimuli, uh, we're also in a magnificent world. Our eyes are closed, but we're in a magnificent universe. And all around us and in us and through us, there's change going on. Uh, the more quiet we get, the more we pick up all the subtle, sometimes um, you know, very specific and also some very subtle changes that are happening in us and around us. And even the our consciousness itself is constantly changing. You know, Rav Chaim Vital says there is no moment of consciousness from the time the world was created till the future that has that is ever the same. So our consciousness itself and all the stimuli that our consciousness is picking up is, is all newness, newness, newness. So this will you know, let us let this be our awareness in this meditation. We do not do guided meditations. Okay, this, everyone's on. on we're, each of us is doing this for our, in our, on our own, but when you, after five minutes, you'll hear the, the chime, that's a signal. Uh, I'll say a verse, this verse, Hashem is my light and salvation. Hashem is the empowerment of my life. And don't think it with words, experience. Hashem is the empowerment of our lives. Our life is renewing at every instant in so many different ways. Our consciousness is picking up the newness of reality in every possible way. Experience that. And even you know, when thoughts come, uh, don't try to push them away. That's something new too, that bubbling up, new, new, new at every moment. Even the words, new, new, new. So you can actually welcome those thoughts, try not to follow the themes, just appreciate the creativity of that, the way the mind bubbles the way that we are a gift to ourselves and we don't do anything to happen. All of this newness is effortless. It's a gift. Okay. That's our meditation, which you want to do for about 15 minutes. And then you'll hear the gong at the end. Which, uh, just to quiet down and we'll open our eyes after about a minute. Okay, I hope that's clear. Five minutes of clearing you know, hashkata, quieting, 15 minutes of this meditation, and then the gong at the very end. Okay, uh, we'll take now our five minutes uh, break at the, uh, for anyone who needs to get up and around and refresh yourself. Uh, during this time, I'm still here, so if you have questions, uh, and let's focus the questions on, on the meditation or on, you know, the principles that we're discussing here for the meditation, uh, the more general discussion we'll have after the meditation at the end. Okay, so take our five minute break now. I'm gonna stop share. And if anyone would like to you know, unmute yourself, uh, best if you can raise your hand and unmute yourself and uh, if you have any questions. Matt, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I just, um, in, the, in the readings, you talk, you're talking about momentary newness, mo moment by moment. Yep. The first reading made a distinction between every moment and the moment of prayer. Yes. So there's something uh, unique and special about the phenomenon of prayer that um, makes consciousness amenable to an alteration in a particular, of a particular sort, rather than just immersion in everything. I don't, I think that's, that's a discussion to have, but it's it's one that occurred to me in the readings. Yeah, did you want to follow up on that, uh, Matt? Well, I mean, we we could follow up on it. The 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 second thing that 
came to me is that what neurosis is, is a blockage of that capacity for momentary newness. Yeah. I mean, I, so, yeah. So you're caught in a repetitive warp. And then I, I, I hearken back to the quotation by Pakuda of a previous session of a kind of presence of another human being that seems to allow that frozenness to break up. And Beautiful. Rabbi Koritz was the one that uh, highlighted that. Right. That's right. In other words, that mindless or totally mindful but contentless presence Beautiful. allows the momentary renewal to occur in a natural way. Exactly. Beautiful. Well, really beautifully framed. Um, you know, Levinas, or Levinas, uh, also says the, the, uh, that our encounter with another consciousness, with another human being, uh, you know, is, is this break in our own consciousness. Uh, and uh, it's a, a, an opening to an, a vast forms of newness as well. Yeah. Rabbi, the, the word conversation is con, which means with, yeah. and versa versare, which means transformation. transformation. A, real conver converse a real conversation is a, an opportunity to transform with another consciousness. Beautiful. Beautiful. Exactly. You know, here we'll be meditating. Uh, we won't be talking with each other, but we are present with each other We're around the planet Earth. Earth. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a, and and so here too. I mean, I think in the midst of this, let's also have the sense of each other's presence as well uh, yeah, that that we're sensing, even though each of us might be in separate rooms, we are together. Thanks, Matt. Does that, uh, Moni had a, a point on the meditation. Yeah, well, a point on the material that leads to it. Do I have this correct? I heard it so differently this time. That's different, or or the contraction is not the contraction of Hashem, but the light of Hashem. Um, yeah, we'll get into that. Maybe let's do that at, at the end. It's an interesting point. Uh, there's this, uh, uh, this whole issue of uh, Ein Sof and Or Ein Sof. You know, God the infinite and the light of the infinite. And we'll, we'll have to piece that. It, there's a, a different Hasidic uh, and Kabbalistic approach to this. The, the Hasidim are influenced by the Ramchal, uh, uh, Muzato, which we can talk about at the end. Okay, but you're right. It's a good pickup. You're you're right, Mona. Good pickup on that. I think. Sure. Anyone else on uh, uh, Menucha? You had a question on the meditation. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just on the text and you know, 35 years of learning with you, I'm still trying to figure out what you mean by consciousness. <laughs> but, so, I mean, and maybe this is a question for Matthew also. If we share our consciousness with the divine consciousness, which I understand time doesn't exist in, and if the Hebrew of the text that we're learning is mochin, then can you expand consciousness to include subconsciousness and unconsciousness or not? Nice question. Let, let's deal with that at the end. And, and please, let's deal with that. Very important. Okay? Very important. Thank you, Manuha. Great. Um, anyone else? On, on a, a question just on the meditation, just the technical aspect that we're about to do. Uh, is that clear for everyone? In other words, we've been doing these, these meditation, uh, this approach to meditation of the cognitive, direct cognitive awareness, right? We get into a, uh, a state of quietness, hashkata, um, in other traditions often called mindfulness, quietness, thinking quiets down. Um, and then we are looking not to inject uh, an idea, but here we have this, this principle of that all of reality is renewed at every instant, all of consciousness is renewed at every instant, and all forms are renewed at every instant. Experience that. Don't just talk about it experience the, that sense of change, 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 renewal, renewal in, in all the stimuli that you feel 
you know, in yourself and around yourself, and then go deeper. The, 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 even the, uh, the way we experience and the way we receive those stimuli, what is it that's receiving that stimuli? Uh, can you begin to even sense changes and shifts in quality of consciousness itself? Okay, in quality of state of mind itself. Can you perceive the, re the renewal of consciousness at every moment that is effortless? We're not doing it. It's happening. It's a gift and that it is our most intimate connection with God directly. Okay, can we experience that and not talk about it? Okay, that's, that's the, that's the challenge here. Okay. All right. I think we're ready to start. So again, we'll, we'll have, uh, I'll start with a little, little chime. It sounds like this. Five minutes of hashkata at the end of which you'll hear again the chime. And then I'll say that verse from Tehillim, uh, which is kind of a theme, just sets a kind of a theme. And then we meditate for ourselves 15 minutes, try to experience newness and this change and that refreshment that is the very essence of what Rosh Hashanah is. Okay? Experience it for ourselves. At the end of the 15 minutes, another chime, the signal to just quiet down for a minute or two and then a final chime at the end. Okay. All right. Bahatzlacha Be'ezrat Hashem. Here we go.
the David, Adonai, Ori Bihishi, Mimi Ira, Adonai, Maoz Chayai, Mimi Efchad. Of David, Hashem is my light and my salvation. Who should I fear? Hashem is the power of my life. Of whom should I be afraid?
as we um, luxuriate in the newness that's all around us and in us. You know, it's, it's our experience of life in all of its ways. Uh, this life that we find ourselves with, there is mysterious as consciousness. Uh, the relationship between life and consciousness is a, an important theme in Kabbalah and in Jewish philosophy as well. I mean, the, the, our consciousness is our modes of perception and life is the condition that we're perceiving in all of its forms, uh, in us and around us. And as we get more and more quiet in all of our, you know, as our consciousness gets very, very quiet in all of its ways, uh, that sense of newness becomes more and more poignant uh, in all of its nuances, in all of its ways. You know, even at, at a level of when consciousness gets so quiet that we're in a state of eternity and the experience of eternity, eternity is not static. The experience of eternity is also alive. You know, this is a, an important point also we find in, in the Rambam in Mor Nebuchim, Guide of the Perplexed, uh, one of his critiques of Aristotle is that uh, the, the Greek concept of God, God is perfect and a, a stasis, unchanging, you know, never changing. Uh, the Jewish sense, you know, the Torah sense of God, as Maimonides conveys, is, yeah, God is uh, beyond anything we can imagine, but uh, if anything, constant newness, constant change, in infinite, eternal, new. Uh, and it's a, you know, so the, the, you know, there's no theology in Tanakh, you know, the systematic theology. God pops up all over the place, <laughs> peaks in, pops up, you know, here, there. You never know. God is new. Uh, so as we get more quiet in these meditations, uh, we can tune into that constant newness that we're not doing it. It's happening. And we, we're on the ride. Anyway, uh, this is our time for, you know, sharing uh, your, what you can take away with this, uh, questions that you have or, or uh, aspects of, you know, how can we apply this in our lives? Uh, how can we use